if you see this painting, you should realize that many people say he's quite handsome and I look like him. This was the painting that hung in the Kirtland Temple along with the other members of the First Presidency and their spouses. You can see the painting of Hiram Smith and his wife in the special collections at BYU. It's in a little room off to the side. The uh, Community of Christ has other of the paintings and you can get copies of them when you go to Kirkland. Um, when my son Warren came as a freshman to BYU, he took a religion class and the teacher said, you know, there are no descendants of Frederick G. Williams that stayed in the church. And he said, wait a minute, I am a descendant. And so she said, are there any other descendants? And six hands went up. I'd like to ask if there are descendants or spouses of descendants, if you'd raise your hand. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, same number. Some of the reasons why it would be of interest to you to know about Frederick G. Williams is he's in some ways unique among the brethren. First of all, he is older, 18 years older than Joseph Smith. So he's not one of the young apostles who are at average 23, 24. He is uh, someone who is already established, had four children when he joined the church, one was a teenager, and he became a very close associate with Joseph Smith, such that he was the scribe for many of the scriptures, most of the scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants in the first edition. And that closeness uh, prompted Joseph and Emma to name their second son with the full name of his counselor, Frederick Granger Williams Smith, which tells you something of their, their uh, friendship. Well, let me give you just a bit of background because what we'll be seeing is strictly out of the scriptures. His family, the Williams family, arrived in Massachusetts in 1620. His father and his uncles all served in the Revolutionary War. One was a general. The, uh, during the independence, and now we have these colonies that are states, only Connecticut was allowed to keep its western areas. And so the western part of Connecticut is the northern part of Ohio where Kirtland is. And Frederick's father, William Wheeler Williams, was contracted to go and found Cleveland. He built the first two sawmills, the homes, and uh, when we had a, a family reunion there, we were absolutely heroes. Lots of press in the newspapers. They took us all around. Here are descendants of the founders of Cleveland. So he was very important. He married, his whole family became seafaring people, uh, trade, international trade. And Frederick became a pilot, and uh, he and his brother served in the War of 1812. He was a pilot for Commodore Perry on the lake, the Great Lakes, and uh, was in those battles on the Great Lakes, and also went over to uh, fighting Tecumseh in Canada. Anyway, many interesting things in regard to that. But Frederick continued to be a pilot on Lake Erie, and on one of his crossings, uh, he met his wife, uh, Rebecca Swain from New York. They married and had four children. He became so affected by the death of his sister in childhood that he said, and alert medicine. So he stopped being a navigator and studied. He apprenticed with a doctor and uh, took out a license, a Thompsonian medical license, and practiced medicine from then on. 
He had been a member of the trustees of Warrensville, just outside of, of Cleveland, and, uh, and then moved to Chardon, and then finally to Kirtland in 1830. So this is where we pick up the story. We knew that he was in Kirtland in 1830 when the four missionaries going to the Lamanites stopped there and preached the gospel. And several people had joined the church. Sidney Rigdon and Frederick T. Williams and his family. But we didn't have anything that would really show this. So when we were doing our doctorate work in Wisconsin, we were relatively close to Nauvoo and to Kirtland. And so we would take weekend trips to go researching. We discovered that we were probably the second person at the LDS Church to come back and do research back then, which was quite surprising to us. But what we have here is a list of the citizens of Kirtland that can vote. So they're only males and they're only uh, landowners. You'll see that it's the 12th of October of 1830. And he is number 93, F.G. Williams. So, ah, a document that shows he is, in fact, a Kirkland when the missionaries come through. You may be interested to know that he became the fifth member of that Lamanite mission. Joseph had called, and you can read in the Doctrine of Covenants, in September, two are called, in October, two more are called, and then later in October, Frederick is called, but not by the first elder, but by the second elder, Oliver Cowdery. And it's very interesting how that came about. He provided them with a horse and buggy, and that was fine until the snow was too hard. Then they took a steamship, and that was fine until the ice didn't allow them to go further. And then finally, they had to walk. I don't know if it was walking for 300 miles in the snow up to their hips. But he was involved. Can you imagine? He's baptized. He's made an elder. And two weeks later, he's called on a mission. He knows it's true. He knows that this is the second elder. And he accepts, leaves his wife, his four children, and goes. He is, a, he is the third that goes across the river to teach the Delaware Indians. And they are very receptive. But then the federal government says no more of that. And they have to come back on the other side of the Missouri River. And Frederick continued to teach the Ka Indians as well as the white population there. And when Oliver Cowdery wrote back about the mission, uh, he said, Frederick isn't coming home until the Lord releases him. Very interesting. One of the first things that he did when he became a member of the church was express his delight in poetry. He wrote, five hymns, five, all five were published in the Evening and Morning Star, and four of them were published in the, oops, we're going too fast here. Four of them were published in the first hymnal. Do we have the mics out here for the, we're inviting a reader or two to read for us. No, no, I want to read the scripture. Yeah. Okay. Here's the first revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants. Who's our root? This is section 64, verse 21. I will not let my servant, Frederick Williams, should sell his farm, for I, the Lord, will, in a strong and wide covenant, for the sake of five years, in which I will not have a covenant, but thereby I 
So they knew going in, they would only be there for five years in Kirtland. The Lord says, I don't want Frederick to sell his farm. I want it to be a stronghold. And it became a stronghold. We wanted to find documents that would show this. And one of the documents is the 1830 tax map. And you can see, if you've been to Kirtland, these are the roads going in and the Chagrin River behind it. He has three quarters of lot 29 and the entire lot 30. These are 144 acres each one. Here is an 1898 atlas and it shows lot 30. Oh, it doesn't want to move. There we go. And it shows that all of the town is on his property, including the Mormon temple. Let's turn to section 81, verses 1 and 2. We can have the same reader or female reader. keys of the kingdom which belong always to the presidency of the high priesthood so he is called to be a counselor one of the first things he did and if you stay for refreshments you can see the original of this he bought a concordance and in the back he had all of the uh, topics in order to speak on topics of the gospel anyway you see the signature fg williams kirkman one january 1833. Here is his license as a member of the First Presidency, signed by Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon. Let's continue in section 81, verses 5 and 7. Wherefore, be faithful, stand in the office which I have appointed unto you, succor the weak, lift up the hands which hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. And if thou art faithful unto the end, thou shalt have a crown of immortality and eternal life in the mansions which I have prepared in the house of my Father. Behold and lo, these are the words of Alpha and Omega, even Jesus Christ. Amen. This is one of the favorite scriptures when someone is called to a position in the church. Because we are to succor the weak, lift up the hands which hang back, and strengthen the feeble knees. That also sounds like, I'm sorry, what a doctor does. And Frederick was a doctor. And we wanted to have some kind of document to show that. We went to Kirtland, and this wonderful lady in the courthouse helped us. And we tried to find some kind of a document. And then she realized doctors didn't have to be registered until the 1890s. So no re record would be found. We came back to Madison and she wrote us a letter and said, oh, I just, I couldn't get it out of my mind. And it suddenly came to me, he may not have had to be registered, but by golly, I bet he had to pay taxes. So she looked it up and sure enough, Here's a list of attorneys and physicians in Geauga County, 1837. And there's Frederick. He earned $200 and paid $1, so 50 cents per hundred. Not bad. Now section 90. Verses 1 and 2. Verily, the 
Thus saith the Lord, I give unto you the united order, organized, agreeable to the commandment previously given, a revelation and commandment concerning my servant Frederick G. Williams, that ye shall receive him into the order. What I say unto one, I say unto all. And again, I say unto you, my servant Frederick G. Williams, you shall be a lively member in this order, and inasmuch as you are faithful in keeping all former commandments, you shall be blessed forever. Amen. This is also a favorite scripture because he used to be a lively member. It's not enough to have the name. The United Order, which was originally called the United Firm, as you read in the Come Follow Me, was a group of six to ten, depending on the moment, of the wealthiest people in the church. And their assignment was, we need to find housing for all of the hundreds of people that are coming to the curtain almost daily. You need to find work for them. You need to find money to publish the scriptures. You need to find money to publish the good tidings of constructing a temple and so many other things that was happening. And he's to be a lively member. And this was important. You can imagine he is a counselor to the prophet. He's the doctor to the community. He now has the responsibility of being in the United Firm, United Order, trying to find a way to accommodate all the people coming in. I think this is the right one. Oop, it keeps jumping. Okay, 93, 41 and to 43. This is probably the most quoted scripture on Frederick G. Forty-three to forty-one. Okay. Oh, but verily I say unto you, my servant Frederick E. Williams, you have continued under this condemnation. You have not taught your children light and truth according to the con commandments, and that wicked one hath power as yet over you, and this is the cause of your affliction. And now a commandment I give unto you: If you will be delivered, ye shall set in your set in order your own house. For there are many things that are not right in your house. If you've read this scripture recently, you remember that right next to it is the same admonition to Joseph Smith and to Sidney Rigdon and a little further on that the bishop of the church. All of them are, in effect, chastised for not teaching their children light and truth. We often wondered in the family, why is it that Frederick was the first to be called out? And I think the answer is in verse 42. I think he, he had done so much in the church. He had done everything that he possibly could, he thought. And yet he felt afflicted. He probably went to the Old Testament for comfort, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon. None was forthcoming. And so he went to the Lord rather than just let it go. And the Lord answered him, and he says, and this is the cause of your affliction. And then he gives them the way to get out of this. Set in order your house and teach your children like and truth. We don't have this admonition in any other scripture. It doesn't matter if you are a member of the first presidency, if you have a high position in the church, if you have a high position in the community, it doesn't matter how busy you are. The most important assignment is your family. Now we'll go to section still in 93, verse 41. Oh, excuse me. It's not coming down. Yeah. 
Yes. We go to verse 52 and 53. The Lord didn't take any of his responsibilities away from him. As a matter of fact, he added more. And let me just say, you're all old enough to know that when you need something done, you call someone who is busy and it will get done. If you ask someone who doesn't have much to do, it doesn't get done. But the Lord expands your abilities. Please, go ahead and read 52 and 53. And let my servant Joseph Smith Jr. and Frederick Drew Williams make haste also. And it shall be given them even according to the prayer of faith. And inasmuch as you keep my sayings, you shall be shall not be confounded in this world, nor in the world to come. And verily I say unto you that it is my will that you should hasten to translate my scriptures, and to obtain a knowledge of history, and of countries, and of kingdoms, and of laws of God and man, and all this for the salvation of Zion. Amen. This is another mission this is his second mission he would serve 11 missions the first presidency would set the example and go on missions but in addition to serving a mission he says i want you to hasten to translate my scriptures this is the bible frederick was the scribe for all of the old testament except 20 chapters of genesis and he was described for some of the new testament so I want you to hasten to translate my scriptures and then to obtain a knowledge of history and of countries and of kingdoms and the laws of God and man. He wants them to study. <laughs> Sex, oops. Section 102, verse 3. Here's, here's a reader. Oh, there you go. Joseph Smith Jr., Sidney Rigdon, and Frederick G. Williams were acknowledged presidents by the voice of the council. This is presidents of the Kirtland Stake. Since they didn't have much to do, now they are the presidency of the state, President Patrick. <laughs> and then here are the list of the high counselors. Go ahead. And Joseph Smith Sr., John Smith, Joseph Coe, John Johnson, Martin Harris, John S. Carter, Jared Carter, Oliver Cowdery, Samuel H. Smith, Orson Hyde, Sylvester Smith, and Luke Johnson, high priests were chosen. And then it says what it goes for. One of the assignments that he had that's not in the Doctrine and the Covenants was to be involved in Zion's camp. 800 or so miles in the heat of the summer <clears throat> to try to help the saints in Missouri. It's a long way to go, and uh, he's not as young as the other people, but he went. He could have said, you know, somebody ought to stay there. But he went, and he became a general in their mock fight. They practiced attacking one another, and they stopped when Parley P. Pratt grabbed a sword and sliced his hand. So, no, let's don't do that anymore. He was also an excellent spy because he was older. He was a doctor. So he would go into the towns that were nearby and he'd say, you know, I've seen a group down there. They're holding a meeting. I'm going to go. Would you like to go with me? Okay. So he would take people down and they would listen to the prophet speak in their Sunday meetings. Anyway, this particular document is his uh, discharge papers. That's his name up at the top. And it's Liberty. Oops. <laughs> anyway, you see it here. I'm not going to mess anymore. Section 103. It's a short one. Why don't you read it, brother? Let my servant Hiram, let my servant Hiram Smith, my servant Frederick J. Williams. It's another mission. 
it's another mission. We have uh, we have skipped one of this one of the scriptures that we should have caught and we didn't, but it's in section ninety, verse nineteen, where the Lord says, if someone has it on their on their uh, light for, and then if you could read that one out loud, I think this is important to not lose. Now verily I say unto you, let there be a place provided as soon as it is possible for the family of thy counselor and scribe, even Frederick G. Williams. Now this is an interesting one. The Lord calls him not only counselor, but the scribe. That's why he's doing all these scribal things. And he says find a place for them to live when he gave his his farm he also gave his home so the lord is saying hey you need to provide it. section 104 okay verse 29 here's here's a reader down here right here And let my servants, Frederick G. Williams and Oliver Cadry, have the printing office and all things that pertain unto it. This is when the United Firm or United Order is disbanded. And whatever they had put into it that could be given back to them was. And so here we have Oliver Cadry and Frederick getting a printing office. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. I'm trying to remember. What they call that is not a copying, but you're right. I remember. What did um, he do as a printer? I remember that. It's like a, it's like a plaster that needs to put in there. Um, yeah, uh, okay, yeah, I'll tell you what. See, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'll look it up and I'm guessing what they recommend. Probably uh, putting modern uh, copying. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Okay, if there's, here we I'm go. watching this. Um, he publishes Do this one. Oh, no, that's what's doing it. I'm sorry, what? Okay, so here's the here's the Doctrine and Covenants. The first edition yeah, of the Doctrine and Covenants is printed by Frederick G. Williams, F. G. Williams and Company. As is Okay. As is the first hymnal. No, we missed it. All right, I'll see you in a little bit. Yep. Right. So you can see the name there. He also publishes the Kirtland edition of the Evening and Morning Stock Bar. He publishes the Latter-day Saint um, LDS Messenger and Advocate. And because he didn't have anything else to do, thank you. Well, let's, we'll get to that in a minute. Go ahead, let's do that one. Yeah. Now, this is a very interesting segue of what he was to be given when they disbanded the firm. We need a reader. Do you want to read it? And this shall be their stewardship, the which shall be appointed unto them, and inasmuch as they are faithful, Behold, I will bless and multiply blessings upon them. And this is the beginning of the stewardship which I have appointed them for them and their seed after them. And inasmuch as they are faithful, I will multiply blessings upon them and their seed after them, even a multiplicity of blessings. That's a very powerful blessing since he had very little to do joseph also asked him to be the editor of a newspaper the northern times a democratic party newspaper and he had to write the editorials and do all of the things that were involved 
also since he had very little to do, he ran for and became a justice of the peace and hence became the first elected official of a member of the church in the church. And here you see some of the things that he did. He performs the wedding of Pali Pipra. And you can see his, his name, F.G. Williams. He's also kind of a notary public. This is a document that Joseph and Emma are selling property and Hiram and Joseph Knight are the witnesses. And down at the bottom, F.G. Williams, Justice of the Peace. I have a list of over 150 documents that he signed as a justice of the peace. And he held court. And although we don't have his uh, docket, we have him in other people's dockets when they transferred the case to others. He was also a member of the uh, ill-fated uh, Curtin Safety Society Bank. And uh, you may wonder why it failed. Well, look, they published a $3 bill. Who ever heard of that? This is the document uh, that he was asked to give when he was and his family were sent out of the uh, out of Missouri with the extermination order. Oh, thank you. And he says, and I think we have it typed up. Yes, we need a reader of what that affidavit says. The affidavit of Frederick G. Williams. I do certify that I was a resident of Caldwell County in the state of Missouri in the year of our Lord, 1838, and owned land to a considerable amount, building lots, etc in the village of Far West, and in consequence of mobocracy, together with Governor Boggs' exterminating order, was compelled to leave the state under great sacrifice of real and personal property, which has reduced and left myself and family in a state of poverty, with a delicate state of health in an advanced stage of life. Furthermore, this deponent saith not, given under my hand at Quincy, Illinois, March 17th, 1840, Frederick G. Williams. Sworn to before. Sworn to before C.M. Woods, Clerk, Adams County, Illinois. He dies in Quincy, and he is buried in the cemetery that was later removed and made a parking lot. Uh, they tried to get a hold of as many family members to say if you'd like to remove the body, but of course our family was in Utah and nobody knew about any of that. So the family erected a monument to him in Quincy in the cemetery where all the others were sent and where his daughter, one of his daughters, was buried. Now here's the summation. We'll need some readers for the summation. It can be the same readers. Frederick Granger Williams, 1787 to 1842, wore many hats and played an important role in the early days of the restoration of the gospel and the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was baptized in 1830 and three weeks later was called to serve a mission to Missouri in the dead of winter with the missionaries to the Lamanites. He would serve a total of 11 missions. Prior to joining the church, President Williams had become a successful doctor with an established practice and a bright future. He became the principal doctor for the saints in Ohio, Missouri and Illinois until his death. Dr. Williams had held an elective civil office for four years in Warrensville, Ohio. He owned land, was relatively wealthy, and highly respected. He entered the church in his mature years. He was 18 years older than Joseph Smith, Jr., forsaking all these material things and vigorously encouraging and vigorously engaging in the church's activities, whatever they were, including the 800-mile march to Missouri in the heat of the summer as part of Zion's camp 
where he served as a military commander, spy, scout, historian, doctor, and paymaster. Although his testimony and love of the gospel and for Joseph Smith caused him to be persecuted and driven from his home in far west, and in time it cost him all that he owned and broke his health, it was only within the church that he rose to his greatest heights. Besides being the prophet's doctor and friend, he was his counselor and scribe. Williams, Williams penned portions of, the, of the Joseph's diaries, letters, and histories, recorded the majority of the revelations contained in the Kirtland Revelation book, and portions of the New Testament and nearly all of the Old Testament in the inspired translation of the Bible. He was also the artist for the plans of the Independence Temple and for the Kirtland Town Plat. President Williams also became a Justice of the Peace, the first member of the church to be elected to a government position. The printing office of the church in Kirtland carried the name F.G. Williams and Company, which publishes published three different newspapers, as well as the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants and the first hymnal of the church, which was prepared by Emma Smith. Frederick G. Williams was also the editor of the Northern Times, a weekly Mormon political newspaper, the president of a bank, the trustee of a school, and a member of the First Presidency. As was prophesied by the Lord, his farm became a stronghold for the church in Kirtland for five years. It was there that the homes of many of the leaders and members of the church were built, as well as the printing office, the school of the prophets, and the first temple in this of this dispensation. This is one of the ones that we missed. President Williams had his sins forgiven him and was an, was accounted as equal with Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon in holding the keys of this last dispensation. He participated in many glorious spiritual experiences, culminating with the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, where he saw an angel who had come to accept the temple, later identified as the Lord Jesus Christ. He lost his position of leadership and eventually even his membership in the church. But whatever his personal weaknesses, he had the strength of character to maintain his loyalty to the prophet and to the covenants of the gospel and to return humbly to the church when it would have been so easy to have dis disintegrated in bitterness. He died an active member of the church in 1842, two years before the prophet's martyrdom. His widow, Rebecca, and his son, Ezra, Ranger, the only child to survive, received their endowments in the Nauvoo Temple and made the journey to Utah. There, Ezra was appointed the first Surgeon General of the Territory by Brigham Young. He went on several colonizing missions, practiced medicine, and established the first hospital west of the Mississippi River. We have some time for questions if you'd like to ask them. This is uh, the Kirtland Revelation book, where the scribe uh, writes the revelations. And here is the Joseph Smith papers showing his handwriting and his signature down below saying, scribe. And you can read it, and he's a doctor. <laughs> We wish we knew. All we know is that he had been asked by Joseph to go to Missouri, to come back to Missouri while Joseph was in Liberty Jail to uh, be the, what do you call it, the administrator of the estate of Sidney Gilbert. 
and uh, because he was the one that had the store. And so what goes to the widow, what stays with the church and so forth. And so he did that. And as soon as it looked like he could get back to Missouri after coming out. And we posit that as people were still coming out of Missouri and they see him going back there, they must have said, oh, he is leaving the church in its hour of need. Well, in fact, he was on the church's errand. And it's ironic that on the very day that he went to visit Joseph in Liberty Jail, back in Quincy, he was being excommunicated along with several other people in absentia. Had, had Joseph been there, he could have explained, well, wait a minute. Um, and so when, they, when Joseph and Hiram does do escape and come to Nauvoo, the first conference that's held there, that's when Frederick says, I need to be baptized again. And of course, he is accepted back in. But he could have said, my goodness, I've given my farm, I've given everything, and I'm not even a member. He could have become bitter. And that's been a great help. When I was bishop and later mission president, temple president, when people would come and felt very offended at something that had happened in the church, I could give him as an example. Do not let that stand in the way. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. His son says of a broken heart. His, uh, the medical record shows from exposure to the winter in Missouri. Yes. Well, again, because he was older, he didn't look like the young people in Zion's camp. And he was a doctor. He had his doctor kit. And he could stay at a hotel. And he, he could take the temperature of the people in that area to see if they were coming after them or not. And if they weren't, then he would invite them to come down to a camp meeting. He would often set up little signs on the road to say, don't go this way, go this way. Some very interesting things along those lines. Yes, yes. There is, there is one suggestion that he was a member of Sidney Rigdon's group, uh, but his son says he was not a member of any church until he joined our church. So there's these conflicting stories. Have a question. How many years have you been up I didn't quite hear that. Oh, the whole time he was in the first presidency. So from 33 to 37. The longest one was 10 months. And most of them were two months, three months. Uh, he went uh, with the prophet to Michigan. We know some of what happened on that because he went on a mission with Sidney Rigdon. We know what happened there because their activities were published in the newspaper. Not a very favorable one. But. Um, I'd have to look it up. Yes. Yes. You remember the scripture that talks about teaching your family light and truth and saying that to all of the presidency. Well, it turns out this is a joke, but that maybe Frederick was the only one that did it because his was the only family that stayed in the church. Joseph's didn't, Sidney's didn't, Oliver's didn't, but Frederick's did. 
And that suggests very strongly that there was no apostasy here for this excommunication. Because if there had been, then his wife would have left and the children would have left. But that was not the case. As a matter of fact, she joins her son and his wife and they move west. First they go to Missouri, then to St. Louis. Then they go to Winter Quarters, and they're the doctor there for the saints in Winter Quarter. Some very interesting experiences there as a doctor. And then Heber C. Kim and Brigham Young says, we need you in Salt Lake. So he comes out in 1849 and uh, becomes, as I mentioned, the first Surgeon General of the territory. And goes on many missions with Brigham Young and uh, helps with uh, the saints and exploring and uh, working among the Indians, especially in Smithfield. Uh, so she comes, she drives her own uh, wagon. <laughs> her own wagon. It wasn't quite a wagon, but it's something like a wagon. And, uh, and she sets up her own little spot and but she stays with her son and they, she's on this mission to Smithfield where she eventually dies. And she becomes the first uh, white woman to be buried in Smithfield. Yes, yes, she has a monument in Smithfield. She, oh, he was buried in Quincy, yes. Smithfield, Utah. He, he didn't. We find him only as the scribe in Joseph's history, in his diaries, in his revelations, and letters, and the printing, and so forth. The only thing we have in his handwriting is his medical journal with the names of all the patients and if he were paid or not and what he was paid with. Chickens. And what they suffered from, yes. He can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> Oh, yes. I'm not going to tell that. <laughs> yeah, one of the things, maybe I will. This is an older group. One of the things that he treated was venereal disease. And uh, he was treating not only members of the church, but he's treating the people in Missouri. And this was kind of a rough place. And... Uh, but maybe some of the people that he was treating for venereal disease were also members of the church. And perhaps that's why he was never attacked by the anti-Mormons, because he had information on them. That's what he wanted me to do. He doesn't call it venereal disease. He calls it bachelor's delight. <laughs> But it's very clear what it is. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, his son was also a doctor, and he served most of his time in Ogden. And uh, he died in 1905. He was uh, credited with vaccinating people against smallpox and saving Ogden. And all of what he was saying uh, was published in the newspapers in California. And doctors came all over the place to say, how are you doing this? This is wonderful. Uh, his wife is the first one in the family to write a history. And she starts it when she's 74. And so we have some information post Frederick G. Williams and we know 
quite a bit about his wife and his son because of what she wrote. She lived to be 95, and uh, so my father got to meet her. Uh, their son, Frederick, who I come through with the full name, was a pioneer in Mexico. He was in the bishopric for 20 years in Colonia Dublan and lost everything when uh, the revolution came and so came out. His son, my father, was a pioneer in South America. He was among the first missionaries in South America, uh, 1927 to 29. He served in the South American mission, which had two districts, Brazil and Argentina. And he got to serve in both. Uh, he was later mission president three times. And uh, so he was very faithful and it was a patriarch. Then I come and then John comes. I come through that line. It's interesting, when my father was called to be president of the Argentine mission, his brother was the president of the Spanish American mission. That's two of three missions in Spanish, and the Williams brothers were presiding over them. Oh, it's marvelous to be able to see that. And if you come to the, the refreshments, I have brought a number of those things and a, a binder that you can look at the various revelations. Because not all of the revelations Joseph Smith received during the Doctrine and Covenants. And some of those uh, are to Frederick. When he was in Missouri and hadn't met the prophet yet, um, the Lord gives Joseph a revelation talking about his farm before the one that's in the Doctrine and Covenants. So he knows what he needs. First, let me back up. I had lived with my family in Spanish-speaking countries. And so I was prepared to be a missionary in Spanish. But I wanted a different language and a different culture. I had already lived in all of the countries where we had missions in Spanish except Mexico. And so my unspoken prayer was answered when my call came to go. There was no MTC at that time and you had to learn the language in the country. And so that's why I knew, uh, but Portuguese was close enough to Spanish that I could be a missionary from day one. And it was a new culture, a new language. And so I became a missionary in Brazil, then mission president in Sao Paulo, and temple president in Recife, Brazil. I think we need to close. Thank you all for coming. Oh, one last question. She, she sensed that that was my profession because I became a professor of literature written in Portuguese at the University of California and, uh, and then 20 years in BYU. And she realized when we got a call from President Kimball and he asked, do you speak Spanish or Portuguese, Sister Williams? No. no. Okay. And so she said, I better learn this. I better learn it. And so she did. And so when we were called and many years later, she could hit the ground running and uh, which wasn't common for most mission presidents wives. But she and all of our missionaries were Brazilian. Uh, we only had two sister missionaries that were American. And, uh, and then, of course, it was so important for her to be able to speak Portuguese when she was a matron of the temple. And she did all of that work. And what a blessing.